It's as if every morning we gathered around the word. It's as if I say this has been a difficult week or we're living in different difficult circumstances. I want to say to you, this has been one of the most difficult weeks in my life. Doing two funerals on Friday. Funeral of a, of a boy that grew up before us, 39 years old. Not COVID related. Funeral of a lady that we knew for quite a few years now. Left a family behind. Broken hearts, broken people. And I, I want to take you in history to a place where there was a man by the name of John the Baptist. John is the cousin of Jesus, born six months ahead of Jesus. And it's, he's the one that, that proclaimed Jesus. He's the one that, that pointed Jesus out in the crowd that says, this is the one. And then John comes to a place of deep doubt, um, deep turmoil because of his circumstances. And John comes to a place where he cries out and he, and he sends two of his disciples to Jesus. And he says, you go and inquire. Is he really the Messiah? Is he really the one? I have a picture before me here, and it's a picture clearly sketched in the Bible. John is in a dungeon. He's in prison. He's in prison for his faith. He's in prison because he pointed out Herod as a sinner. He pointed him out as a man, a godless man. And so he's in prison, and, and it's, it's like this man's ministry, who the, the point of his ministry was, to make Jesus real. And he's in prison for it. And he comes to a place of doubt. And, and, and you know what, beloved? We look around us. And if you are strong this morning, and if there's no doubt in your own heart, you must know that there are umpteenth of, uh, uh, of our beloved people around us that really doubt this morning. That really ask the question, Jesus, are you the one? Or are we looking for another? I pray, my Father, that your words will be quickened to our spirits this morning. I pray, my Father, that your word will be alive in my mouth as a, as a skilled pen of an author writing down the things that are in your heart magnifying the things that are meaningful to you, my Father. I ask you that in Jesus' name. Grace us by your Holy Spirit, my Father. Your anointing is more important than any clever thoughts I might conjure. I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And... Um, it's John speaking, verse 19 and verse 20. John's disciples told him about all the things that were happening. Jesus was performing many miracles. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord asking, Are you the one that is to come or should we expect someone else? When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come or are we looking for another? At that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind. And he replied to these two guys, go and report to John what you've seen and what you have heard. Give him a loving report. In John 1.29, we, we find this beautiful picture john is busy baptizing hundreds of people the people are coming from all over because john is preaching a hard message this wild man he's dressed wildly he looks wildly his hair is all wild and john is preaching a wild message and he said to them 
And, and, and this is his message, message, repent for the kingdom of God is at, is at hand. In other words, the kingdom of God has come near. And they, they are bewildered because for 400 years there's been prophetic silence. The, the, the scriptures are quiet be, between Malachi and uh, Matthew. 400 years of prophetic silence. Suddenly here's a man, a wild man, and he's preaching to the crowd. He says, get your lives in order because the kingdom of God is at hand. And then as he is baptizing, he looks up. He sees his cousin walking on the banks of the river. But he doesn't see his cousin. He sees another picture. And the picture is from Leviticus chapter 16. And John cries out. He says, behold, look, take note. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John announces the coming while he's baptizing. His attention is drawn to that in, incredible appearance of somebody that would take the people's sins away. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever considered whether everything you believe about God is actually true? I want to ask you another question. Have you ever doubted God? Beloved, my number one problem while I'm living in this body, while I'm living on this earth with five senses testifying to me about what's happening around me. My number one problem, I call it the holy flesh, the flesh that, that Paul refers to, my old sinful nature. You see, here's a process. And I told you so many times in 1975, I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus. Maybe you surrendered your life in 1980, 1990, maybe just last year. And here's the wonderful, beautiful thing that happens. My life is transformed and suddenly I find myself living a better life. Those things that were attractive to me suddenly lose their hold on me. And I pray and it's like God hears me. I'm the only person on earth and he hears me and I'm important to God. And I want to say to you, God is treating this spiritual baby very nicely. Very nicely. And then after maybe six months, in some cases after nine months, suddenly some speed wobbles on the journey. Suddenly things, there are potholes on my road. There are obstacles I have to swerve out to avoid. And, 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 and it could feel like God is upset with me. <laughs> and this is the process of maturing. This is the process of, of developing godly character. I want to talk to you briefly about the cross in my life. You see, here's, here's God's desire. And here is my life, my practice. You see, let me put it to you this way. Dying on a cross was a lengthy process. Most people took six to nine hours. Some people took 12 hours to die. And so it's a, it's a lengthy process. And what do I talk about? Here's a fleshly manifestation that reoccurs. I, I come back to a place where I doubt where I'm angry, where I'm jealous. I come to a place where I compare myself to others. And God has a desire that this very baby, this spiritual baby will become mature. Maturity and fruitfulness go hand in hand. It's the goal of all the exams and tests. I'm writing exams to mature. And so God, it's like he allows me to go through some testing. And, and I want to say to you, we don't like that about God. We don't like that about the kingdom. Because in our minds, we have this picture that I'm now saved. I'm a child of God and everything should be hunky-dory. You see, God desires that in this journey, I will develop spiritual authority. I will develop character. I will develop fruitfulness. And I will develop spiritual authority. 
You see, the cross is designed to destroy the flesh once and for all. In this process of doubting and in this process, the place you and I find ourselves in at the moment, there's the reality of, do I trust him? Are you the one? Are you the one, Lord Jesus? A Sunday school class had to learn Psalm 23 off by heart. They were six, seven-year-olds. I remember I, when I did Sunday school, I had to work with six, seven-year-olds. The teacher gave them a month to learn Psalm 20, 23. One six-year-old was extremely excited about the project, but he found it nearly impossible to get beyond verse 1. After much effort, he was eventually challenged to go forward in the class and to recite Psalm 23. And this is what he said. He stepped forward very nervously and he said, The Lord is my shepherd and that's all I need to know. Isn't that, isn't that exactly the place God wants me to get to? The Lord is my shepherd. I go through a valley of a shadow of death. Listen, there are beautiful pools where I drink. There are beautiful uh, feeding troughs where I feed myself. But listen, he's the shepherd. And if he's with me, that's all I need. I'm okay. In this journey with God, there's no stability guaranteed. You see, John is the one who declares he is the one that takes away the sins of the world. Luke 3.16. And, and John is popular. People are crowding. And then suddenly, John start, started losing his popularity. In Luke 4.36, there, there was a rumor going around that Jesus is attracting more people to follow him than what John was. And, and John was losing. His church was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then John judged the, the, the governor because of his relationship with, a, with another woman. And he's thrown in prison. Can you see this with me this morning? John is busy doing the will of God. God put him on this planet with one purpose. To declare the kingdom of God. But he's in prison for it. You see, we have developed a new doctrine that says come and dine. In instead of come and die. God wants my flesh to die. God wants me to be such a servant of the kingdom that my own will and my own flesh is out of the way. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me daily. And here's the thing that you need to see with me this morning. Anybody walking down the street with a cross on his back was busy going to death. He was going to die. And so the people knew that very, very well. They were acquainted with the reality that a man with a wooden cross on his back is busy dying. Jesus says, do it daily. In other words, there's no following me. There's no room for the flesh. John starts doubting. He sent two disciples. I need real friends when I start doubting. Beloved, let me, let me. So emphasize this. Let me make this clear. You need to fight for your faith. And one of the ways in which we fight is to, to just be honest with each other. To say, wow, man. I thought I had this thing taped. I thought this kingdom stuff, I am au okay with it. But here's the reality. When I start doubting, I need to tell somebody about it. And John has two close disciples, men that he could trust with his emotions. And he said to them, boys, I doubt if Jesus is the one. Will you go and find out? There's no stability guaranteed in walking with God because we're living, we're part of a broken world. The, the stuff that happened in the past week really jarred our emotions, jarred. Feelings of, of racism and hatred and violence in our own hearts. Let's be honest about it. 
in this kingdom, no stability guaranteed. And so the two disciples came to Jesus. <coughs> the reality is he didn't preach to them. He demonstrated. They saw Jesus demonstrate and he calls them. He says, hey boys, come, let me show you. Not a sermon, a demonstration. We need to see the deliverance of our Lord. And then he's challenged to them, go and tell John what you saw. Go and tell John what you saw. You see, when, when, when Peter got out the boat, there were 12 disciples in the boat. And only one had the guts to climb out and say, Jesus, I also want to walk on the water. In fact, all 12 of them believed that they could walk on the water. But Peter got out. He didn't only believe it mentally. He got out and he walked and then seeing the storm and looking at the waves, he doubted and he started sinking and Jesus comes, grabs him. Now, here's a, the miracle thing about Peter. He walked on the water twice. But here's the thing. Jesus said to him, Peter, why do you doubt? And the word for doubt is distazu. This stutzu, it means like a chameleon. Do you ever watch a chameleon? This eye goes that way and this eye goes that way. Uh, to doubt, this stutzu literally means, why do your eyes look in two directions? You look a little bit at me, but you look a little bit at the waves as well. Things in South Africa draw our attention away from Jesus at the moment. Let me share some things that cause me to doubt so we can deal with them. I, I operate on feelings instead of truth. Sometimes we get so emotional about what's going on around us, about what's going on inside of us, that we lose out on, on clinging to truth. We cling to feelings. You see, babies want to manipulate through tantrums. Babies learn at a very early age how to draw mom's attention. And that's sometimes in our faith work, we, we just operate like babies. I might think that true Christianity does not include a prison. True Christianity does not include a grave. I might think that true Christianity doesn't have financial lack included. Go tell John what you see. And then Jesus says in Luke 7 verse 23, Blessed is he. Whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, offense, uh, the Greek word is skandalon. It's like a trap. So there's a trap lying there and it's waiting for you to step into it. And Jesus says, when I allow you to go through certain things, there's a trap, boy. There's a, there's a, a thing that might catch you. Don't be offended. Don't get trapped in the scandalon. I, I, I'm just maybe over-exaggerating. Maybe I'm over-emphasizing. Maybe my mind's running away with me. But the feeling I have is that Jesus was saying, John, John, remember you were in your mother's womb and my mother came to visit your mother and you leapt inside your mother's womb. There was a jumping going on at the, at the hearing of my mother's voice and at the feeling of my presence. And it's like Jesus is saying, now this is Cornelius' picture. It's Jesus is saying, John, leap over the scandalon. Leap over this thing that will offend you. Don't get offended at me, my beloved brother, sister. Don't get offended at this time. God, I'm so angry at you. That's when you've been caught in the trap, in the scandal. John, leap as your mother, as you did in your mother's womb. Leap across this thing. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Paul writes, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in, that means in, in, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm really strong. You see, when I lean on the flesh in my own ability, 
I need a miracle, a spirit miracle in my life. When I'm weak, then I'm really strong. Here's how you build your faith, beloved. Number one, Jude 20. Jude has only got one chapter. That's toward the end of the Bible. Jude 20 says, You, beloved, building yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. You have to go aside. You have to pray in the Spirit. Now, this is basically speaking in tongues. And if you haven't got that, go to a spirit leader. Go to somebody that can help you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But pray in the Spirit. Romans 8.26 says, Sometimes we do not know how we ought to pray. But the Spirit makes intercession for us according to the will of God. So here I am in the Spirit, groaning before God. I'm going through this terrible time in my life. And the Holy Spirit assesses, assesses me. He helps me to pray successfully into the throne room. Number two, never lean on your own understanding. In Proverbs 3 verse 5, we are taught, never lean on your own understanding, but lean on the Lord. Lean on the word of the Lord. Find your place. Building yourself in your faith means make room for the words of God to build a different picture in your thinking processes. Get rid of the fleshly thinking. Number three. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 24, 25, we're confronted with the reality of a godless king that had Daniel and his three friends thrown into the fire. They made the fire seven times hotter because these were men of God. And they threw them in the fire. And it says that the men that threw them in the fire even died. So hot the fire was on the outside of the fire. And then the king looks and he's, he's totally exasperated. He looks at this and he says, What's going on? We threw three men in the fire and there's a fourth one with him. I want to challenge your faith today. Beloved, if you can look in the fire, you will see there's a fourth one. The Lord Jesus Christ is with you, is for you, and is in you. He's with you in this fire. Never ever doubt that as you go through things because we are going through things as you go through things just confess i am my beloveds i belong to you my lord you are with me you are for me and you are in me that's a that's a resting place and on his breast number four we read the story of Aaron and her. Moses' arms were getting tired. As long as he held up his arms, the Israelites had victory over the enemy. But the moment he got tired and he dropped his arms. In other words, sometimes we have to uphold our faith. Sometimes we have to, we have to fight things that we don't understand, we don't see. But holding up our hands means holding up in faith. And when his arms got tired, God commanded two men, Hur and Aaron, and said, you go hold up his arms. And as long as they held, they held up his arms, there was victory. Do you have friends that are close to you? I've asked you before in this sermon. I need an Aaron and a Hur. I need somebody to stand with me. I want to ask you also, are you maybe an Aaron? or a her, to somebody that's struggling right now. Maybe your husband. He's just been laid off from work. Beloved, we need each other like never, ever before. Let me pray with you in Jesus' name. Just where you are there, take hands and let's pray together. My Father, thank you that we could call you Father. Thank you that we can cry out this morning and say, Lord, we know you are the one. There could be doubt in our hearts when we are so confronted with all these things happening around us. But there's a little voice inside of us saying, you are the way, the truth and the life, Lord Jesus. 
Holy Spirit, come help my unbelief. Holy Spirit, come and help me cling to, to, to this Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, as never before, so that I can make a stand, so that, so that people can see when looking at me that there's something different about my life. I don't want to go lie in bed every night rolling around, worrying about tomorrow. I want to surrender to you, my Lord. You will be in my tomorrow. You've made up your mind. I ask you to bless us. Bless our hearts, O oh Father, with, a, with an impact from your spirit and from your word in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.